advice from me about how that went. I think it's pretty, pretty obvious. It's a legitimate question to say, is this an episode or is this a, a condition? And so when people ask that question, it's completely legitimate of both candidates. There is no greater risk uh, to <clears throat> this country than the idea that a president in his official capacity can do anything they want. Hello, I'm Caitlin Huey Burns in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. President Biden is promoting his administration's climate actions in Washington, D.C. today as the storm still swirls over concerns about his age and acuity, plus the Supreme Court's decision on presidential immunity. With fear for our democracy, I dissent, end of quote. So should the American people dissent. I dissent. Meanwhile, former President Donald Trump is seizing an opportunity. New York's district attorney is agreeing to delay sentencing in the former president's hush money verdict after Trump called for the court to called for a court to overturn his conviction. We'll start tonight with Scott McFarlane and Finn, Go Finn Gomez joining me now at the table. Gentlemen, good to see you. A lot to get to here today. But uh, we have been waiting to hear from the president in a press conference. We haven't gotten that today. We're supposed to get that uh, next week. But Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, did take lots of questions today. She didn't answer all of them. Let's play a little bit of uh, her exchange with our White House correspondent, Weijia Jiang. After the debate, did the president get examined by a doctor, or did he get a neurological scan? A neurological scan? Look, um, what I can say is that, just to take a step back, it was a bad night. We understand that it was a bad night. Um, and the president has spoken to this. And he understands that. All right, so Finn, obviously not an answer there, but, uh, you know, this underscores the idea that we are five days removed from this debate, and this is still the biggest topic in Washington, but also beyond Washington. Mm -hmm. This is something that the campaign knows they have to address, but they are taking lots of criticisms within the, their own party about how they're not addressing it. Um, I know you've been speaking to Biden campaign sources. What are they telling you? Uh, they are telling us that, you know, they feel that they're in a hard place. That's a quote. They're in a hard place right now. They understand that. They're, they're in the midst of a knife fight, one of them, one of the advisors told me. But they are planning to soldier on, uh, asked if they, if they expect the president to drop out, to step down. They say no, absolutely not. He plans to continue at this point. Uh, I, I would say that in that press briefing that we saw earlier today with our Weege and so many other of our great colleagues answering, asking those tough questions. That answer, as you said, was not really given, right? It wasn't really that that question was not answered. Uh, it was more than just a bad day. And I think the, the census that we, we've been getting from speaking to both top Democrats and Republicans, but really top Democrats, not only along, those along with Biden world, mm -hmm. is that it was much, much worse than just a bad day. And mm -hmm. that answer has still not been really explained. Yeah. And Scott, I mean, to that point, after the debate, there were a lot of Democrats kind of talking behind the scenes, talking privately. Now they are out on TV. They are putting their faces behind uh, these questions that they have and questions about whether Biden should be the nominee. What are you hearing from Capitol Hill? There's so many congressional Democrats who have busy in-district weeks around a holiday. You have lots of events, parades, barbecues, ribbon cuttings. It's a great-to-be-seen kind of week, and they are getting dogged mm. by questions from constituents and from media about this. And this is not something they want to be talking about mm -hmm. in an election year or otherwise. And that's becoming a source of frustration mm -hmm. for members of Congress, that they are now mm -hmm. off message and off topic and certainly not wanting to talk about this as an alternative. You noticed over the past 24 hours, some of the equivocation, some mm -hmm. of the mushiness now and how they respond to these questions. There was a declarative nature to how Democrats were defending the president Friday, Saturday and Sunday, yeah. especially on the Sunday shows. Mm -hmm. His top surrogates saying this is something they will move past and soldier forward. Now you hear from some Democrats currently in office and otherwise about alternatives. Lloyd Doggett of Austin, Texas, making the first move, potentially the only move, but the mm -hmm. first move of an actual sitting Congressional Democrats saying President Biden should withdraw. The question that will define this night and tomorrow morning is, will somebody else join him? Mm -hmm. That's in office now. There's been candidates who've done it, mm -hmm. former members of Congress, progressive voices out there who mm -hmm. have the ear of the White House, 
Does his second office holder join Lloyd Doggett? That's what the next 24 hours will determine. And even if they don't join him, lots are expressing their frustrations and saying what they want Biden to do if he is to remain at the top of the yeah. ticket. Uh, let's play some sound from one congresswoman talking about just that. I need to see him out everywhere talking unscripted, no teleprompter, and he needs to make sure that the American people have confidence um, in his ability to, to run for reelection. So, Scott, I know you cover Capitol Hill, you cover all these races, you've interviewed Andrew Craig a lot of uh, times as well. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of what she represents, this kind of district, and the significance of her saying this kind of thing. Matt right there is a frontline Democrat. Frontline means somebody who's got a tough reelection because of the composition of her district. But she's channeling the voices of people who have safe districts as well, saying there needs to be a strategy employed, that they've been urging more media appearances, more town halls, more rallies, more unscripted audience settings for the former president. And there is concern that so many days have gone by where that has not been done. Mm -hmm. The time's a-wasting. He's now scheduled, according to the White House, for a Friday nationally televised interview. There's a lot of real estate between now and Friday, a lot of time for these stories and this opposition to foment and fester. And at the same time, you know, they wanted to use this week to talk about Trump. Obviously, this big Supreme Court yes. decision that came down yesterday. Um, how is the campaign navigating all of that? Do they see a path forward? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I spoke to a, a top surrogate for the president in the battleground state of Pennsylvania just a little while ago. And he tells me, look, um, it, why isn't there more attention on this big ruling from the Supreme Court? Why isn't there more concern coming from Democratic voters, not even our base voters or, you know, or, or, the, or the members on the Hill uh, about this? This is this is a very, uh, very stark and and and, uh, and, and to, to him, uh, uh, something that we sh there should be a lot more attention and there should be more concern about right than, than, mm -hmm. than what's going on with the president. Uh, however, I mean, we are in a political season. Uh, there are political ramifications. Uh, to you know, to to the actions or uh, of the campaign, and as as Scott just mentioned, like I mean, this this thing could be this this could impact not only down down ballot races, but uh, but not just in on the congressional side, on the House side, but on the Senate side, Senate side as well. They're defending a lot of territory now, right? And so those Senate seats are up, you know, are are, are significant, and you could you know there is the concern that you can lose both houses to the Republicans come November, and also like where does this go? Uh, where does this go, CHB? If you look at there's there's polling coming out this week. Uh, mm -hmm. New York Times may be coming out with a poll, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, and you're you're seeing these cracks that the Scott just talked about. This cracks in this in the, in, amongst the Democratic front. Uh, yeah. what, what is the end game? How can this be fixed? And can they answer the question? Will the president be the, be able to be the president for the next mm -hmm. four and a half years? Our latest yeah. reporting yeah. on some of these down ballot races yeah. is that from. Congressional Democrats and Democratic campaigns tell CBS News there was a noticeable uptick in the donations they received for House candidates mm. after the debate. There's mm -hmm. two reasons for that. Potentially both are operative. It was the end of the quarter, and everybody likes to juice their fundraising right at the sure. end of a quarter. There's sure. a few days to do that. But also that there may be this pitch going out of a House firewall. Mm. These may be the most winnable races that can put Democrats in charge of some part of government, mm -hmm. more so than the Senate, and if that debate doesn't have a d dynamic change, more so than the White House. And that seems to be an acknowledgment of what, you know, could happen, uh, obviously, if, if Biden loses. They're already preparing to uh, focus on firewalls. the yeah. firewall. Exactly. Um, well, Scott McFarlane and Finn Gomez, much more to talk about, much more to go, and we will continue on that. Thank you both for joining us. And switching gears here, Rudy Giuliani has been disbarred from practicing law in New York State for his part in Donald Trump's alleged election interference efforts in 2020. A New York appeals court says Giuliani, Giuliani made, quote, demonstrably false and misleading statements while serving as former President Trump's attorney. Giuliani has been indicted in both Arizona and Georgia in connection with his alleged role to keep Trump in power after he lost the 2020 election. And former Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan says it's time to, quote, rip the Band-Aid off and replace President Biden on the ticket. He joins us next to discuss. You're streaming America Decides.
Former Ohio Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan says Vice President Kamala Harris should be his party's new nominee for president. In a new piece, he writes, Joe Biden's debate performance was deeply troubling. But it isn't just about 90 minutes in a debate a, and a terrible performance. This election needs to be about generational change, something about which I have been shouting for more than a year now. And let's bring in former Ohio Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan. He also ran against President Biden for the Democratic nomination back in 2020. Congressman, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. So in this yeah. op-ed today saying that Biden should step aside and Kamala Harris should be the nominee, why? Why are you arguing for that? Well, we all saw the debate on Thursday. I mean, you, you can't ignore it. You can't ask people to unsee what they saw. Uh, not only did they, they watch it in real time, uh, so many people have personal experiences with their parents, their grandparents. They know what the aging process looks like. And, and that person on the stage there was not capable of, of governing the United States of America, being in those difficult meetings, being in those difficult situations. And so I think we have to recognize that as quickly as possible rip the Band-Aid off. We have a, a great vice president who has three and a half years of, of seasoning at, in the highest levels of government. She would be a, a great campaigner, energize our base. So many of the different aspects of the Democratic coalition would be super excited about uh, a Kamala Harris run. And uh, we should get behind her and, and take the campaign to Donald Trump and, and get this country back where it needs to be. And Congressman, do you think that it's possible at all for Biden to recover from this if he doesn't step aside? I think it's it's impossible, honestly, that that he would somehow recover. I mean, the images from that debate will continue to be reinforced throughout the next four months. Low information voters, this is going to be exactly what they're going to remember. And you're seeing it in the polling that's coming out, uh, dripping out here in the, in the last you know 12 hours or so. There's there's no recovering from something like this. And we just we love Joe Biden. I love Joe Biden. I was the first Democrat to support Joe Biden in, in 2020, as you said. Um, we the seasons change. We have to do what's right. You know, we're seeing this in real time as well. Like we saw the Chevron decision from the Supreme Court last week. We saw the immunity decision yesterday that basically flipped the Constitution on its head. Like, the stakes are so high right now. We can't afford to go into this election handicapped, you know, by a candidate who can't even articulate the, the, the five-minute press conference from a teleprompter when presidential immunity was granted to Donald Trump or anybody else who wants to commit any crime they want. We're basically back to king status. And there was a five-minute muted a press conference from a teleprompter. Like, that's not where we are in America right now. We've got to be actively engaged in fighting against this stuff. And if we lose the Senate and we lose the White House, you're going to have every federal court is going to look like the Supreme Court does now with, with Kavanaugh uh, and with these other characters on the court from the Federalist Society. That'll be in every federal bench across the country. Every U.S. attorney and every district across the country will be a radical. And, and that's a scary situation for, for a lot of people. And we, we have a, a choice to make now. We better make it. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit more about that. What do you think the effects will be down ballot if he stays on top of the ticket? I am thinking about the Ohio Senate race. You live in Ohio. You um, served in Ohio. Um, Sherrod Brown is up for re-election there. What kind of impact do you think that would have on that race in particular and other down ballot races if Biden remains at the top of the ticket? I, I think it would be brutal. Like, I don't think we can we can like be polite right now and sugarcoat things. It will be brutal. Our base will not be energized. We are already having issues with young people. Uh, we're already losing uh, different aspects of the, the different minority groups, of the black community, the brown community. Um, and I think you know if we continue down this road, we're not going to have much of a turnout. And you're going to hang people like Sherrod Brown, John Tester, Bob Casey over in Pennsylvania. You're going to hang them out to dry, you know, or you put in Kamala Harris, she's going to energize young people. She's going to energize those uh, different minority uh, groups and minority communities. She's going to be able to prosecute the pro-choice argument. She'll destroy Trump in a debate. 
um, he won't know what to do with her. And, and she'll have an aspirational vision for the country, and it'll be a generational change. So to me, it's like, what are we waiting for here? It's time to act. We have to be decisive. We have to act with some conviction, uh, or you know, things are going to spin out of control, and there's going to be no, no turning back. And as I mentioned, you are a former member of Congress. Have you been talking with any of your former colleagues who are currently serving in the House or the Senate who are voicing these same concerns you are and want him to drop out? Yeah, there's a lot of concern. Um, certainly not going to mention any names. People can, you know, go public on their own. But I think there's a big concern. I mean, the Democrats with a good candidate at the top of the ticket could probably win the House uh, back. Um, and Hakeem Jeffries, you know, can be the first you know, black speaker of the House. I mean, it'd be trend setting. Uh, it would be good for working class people. Um, it, that that hangs in the balance here. That's why we have to act. So there's uh, there's a lot of concern, and I think people are being very respectful to give uh, the president and his family their their space. But it's you know it's it's Tuesday, and the debate was on Thursday, and the polling's coming in. Uh, I think it's time to, to get moving here. All right, Congressman Tim Ryan, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks. And a triumphant time for Trump, from the Supreme Court immunity decision to his debate performance. Next, our Bob Costa joins with more on the former president's big wins. You're streaming America Decides. The judge who presided over Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial in New York has postponed his sentencing. Judge Juan Mershon approved the delay after the former president's lawyers asked for more time to review the potential impact of the Supreme Court's immunity decision. That came down yesterday. His sentencing was originally scheduled for next week, and now it will take place on September 18th. Our own Robert Costa is here with me now covering all of this. Bob, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so this delay is significant. I mean, it was... The original sentencing date was supposed to come just days before the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. Um, what's the impact here? Uh, it will still happen before the election. Well, for me personally, it's about whether I can get my money back for my hotel <laughs> reservation on July 11th, because that was the sentencing yeah. date for right. former President Donald Trump. Now in September, so this changes the entire political calendar, both Republicans and Democrats I've been speaking to have been bracing for weeks mm. for July 11th to be a significant day because it would decide whether Trump would be sentenced to house arrest, probation, or even a jail sentence that could start as early as this summer or even this fall. Mm -hmm. Now, all of that is pushed back. Now, it's not mm. pushed beyond November. It's mm -hmm. just pushed back until September. So this is potentially for the campaign, not a July surprise, but a mm. September surprise. Uh, but because of the immunity question hovering over this campaign, there's no real guarantee this is still going to happen in September. The judge mm -hmm. could rule that in some way there still needs to be a deliberation legally mm -hmm. about whether Trump can be sentenced in New York uh, in terms of whether something's an official act or not. Because mm -hmm. Judge Tanya Chutkin on a federal level will be working through what's an official act or not on the January 6th case that could impact what happens in New York. So we're in a fluid moment legally and politically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if that sentencing does happen in September, it will be right around the time early voting starts in some of these states, too. So that will be interesting to watch. Uh, you mentioned the immunity case. I want to ask you a little bit about that. Um, obviously, Democrats are, you know, criticizing this court decision. But I'm curious what this ruling may mean for a Trump administration, what he could do with this kind of immunity when going forward. Trump was elected in 2016. I covered his transition closely, and it was evident that he was not familiar with the apparatus of the federal government to any real extent. And he brought in some advisors who had some seasoning in terms of managing the federal government, but it took him three to four years to fully understand the scope of the federal government, the mm -hmm. powers of the executive. So if he now comes into power, he's not the Donald Trump who came down that escalator and really didn't have a, a grasp of the government and governing. He is someone who knows what it means to be president and to have presidential power. He's also an advocate for presidential power. So we're looking potentially mm -hmm. at a presidency, a second Trump term, where you would have expansive use of presidential power, especially in the wake of this ruling. And what has the Trump campaign's reaction been to this ruling? Are they kind of pushing that as, as a message, or are they kind of letting that 
rest for a bit. It's a bit of a political and policy dance for them. They know that there are groups like uh, Project 2025 that are outlining potential steps the Trump administration could take on different fronts. But at the same time, they're not fully embracing that because they want to be a bit coy, I'm told, by Trump advisors about what exactly Trump would do in his presidency. But we do already see that Trump is signaling a real use of executive power. Uh, the Supreme Court, of course, has given him some power. Maybe Trump would have another appointment as president. But one of his key mm -hmm. policy proposals is a mass deportation, as he calls it, of undocumented people mm -hmm. in this country. And that would be a significant use of executive power because it would mm -hmm. possibly involve the use of the military and other federal mm -hmm. agencies to remove people, remove families from the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like all of these areas are where Democrats can kind of seize on, at least at this point, especially after the president's poor debate performance. Speaking of that debate performance, I know a lot of attention has been focused on the president, of course, but, um, you know, Donald Trump did have lots of lies, exaggerations during the debate as well. Has his team been reacting to that? How have they been talking about this debate? I mean, it was interesting. I was with him covering him on Friday after the debate in Virginia, and he made a point to say this is not about age, it's about competence. And I'm curious how they are kind of playing this out, or are they kind of laying low and letting the attention focus on Biden? It's more of the latter. They see the debate, in their view, as a clean win. And they don't feel the need to have Trump hitting the drum on that issue. They're letting Democrats, in the views of some of my sources, go to war with each other mm. over the debate and its consequences. And they're, they're happy to watch all of that play out from their side of things and prepare for what's now most important for them, which is the vice presidential selection. All right. And we will stay tuned for that around the convention, perhaps earlier. Bob Costa, thank you very much for Thanks, your time. Caitlin. And a quick programming note, join us for a special Independence Day edition of America Decides. Our CBS Reports documentary team went out into the field to talk to voters behind the polls. This half-hour documentary is followed by an America Decides panel about what it all means for the election in November. That airs this Thursday, July 4th at 5 p.m. Eastern. And the new ad that's taking aim at Donald Trump as President Biden works to put his debate performance behind him. Our political panel takes a deep dive into the post-debate deflection. You're streaming America Decides. The Biden campaign is hoping to flip the narrative following Thursday's debate. A new campaign ad is hitting the airwaves in battleground states. Did you see Trump last night? I mean it sincerely, the most lies told in a single debate. He lied about the great economy he created. He lied about the pandemic he bought. Let's bring in our political panel, Joel Payne and Christian Ramos. Joel is CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist, and Christian is also a Democratic strategist who served as an aide for former Senate Majority Harry, Lead, uh, Harry Reid. Excuse me, gentlemen, great to see you here. Um, so in that ad, conveniently left out, Joel, of course, is the president's own debate performance. Mm -hmm. um, instead, clips from the rally the next day on teleprompter uh, with supporters. Um, how do you assess how Democrats are handling this right now? I mean, we had the press secretary today fielding questions from reporters, not answering a lot of them, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, how is the White House doing here? That was a good ad. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it was a good ad. I don't think it's going to solve all the problems that the president and his team are managing at the moment right now. I think what Democrats um, are doing is giving the president some space and giving his team some space to kind of analyze the political environment right now. I mean, essentially, you had an extinction level event <laughs> with that yeah. debate last week. And I think what you have now is a lot of fallout and people just trying to assess what the fallout is. It's clear that Inside the Beltway, establishment, grass top Democrats, there's some growing consensus um, and concern mm -hmm. about President Biden. What's not mm -hmm. clear is that has that gotten to voters yet? And I think mm -hmm. you're looking for polling, you're looking for any data points mm -hmm. um, to make that case if you're someone who thinks the president should get out or mm -hmm. if you're someone on the president's team who wants to encourage him to stay in. And that's what we're doing at the moment. I mean, speaking of that polling, Christian, our polling showed that nearly half of Democrats don't want Biden to be the nominee. Whether he steps aside or not, and that's still such a you know tall order, essentially, he's given all indications that he's staying in. How do Democrats possibly make the case to voters, turn out for our guy when 
they're voicing their own concerns about this very person. Well, I'm pretty sure in that same poll, more than half of Republicans also don't want Donald Trump to be their nominee. So there is that. I, I hear what you're saying. But like to answer your question, listen, Joe Biden has an incredible record to run on. He has a lot to say. He has a lot to do. Did he have a bad night <laughs> on Thursday? Extinction level, de, you know, event. Uh, Buster Rhymes reference there. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it was bad. But he has four more months to put it all together. Really, they have to make their case. And yesterday's Supreme Court case that just happened with Donald Trump, mm -hmm. to me, that's the type of thing that really focuses the election focuses voters on what exactly is at stake here. Can we all imagine an imperial Donald Trump presidency right now? If that guy gets into office and does whatever he wants, that should be a part of the conversation that we're having as we discuss yeah. uh, the post debate. But, but Democrats have been making the argument, to your point, that democracy is at stake here. We have to do, in their words, we have to do everything we can to defeat Donald Trump. And yet, Biden as the nominee, a lot of them are also saying, look, we don't think he can do that. Yeah, and I think what the president and his team are trying to assess is whether or not that is that is still the default. I think that there's strong belief among his team that they can manage the fallout from the debate mm -hmm. and they can keep his viability. But I, I want to pick up on Christian's point. Okay, we've spent, it's been five days since the debate. Mm -hmm. There's a hundred left. These days are gold. That's the only thing in, in, in politics you yeah. can't get back yeah. is time. So right. instead of spending the last five days focusing, laser focused on Donald Trump, his lies, his um, misstatements on stage last week, and all of the yeah. terrible things he wants to do with Project uh, 2025, Democrats have been talking about the future mm -hmm. of this ticket. And whether or not talking about the future of this ticket is harmful, the fact that Mm -hmm. The focus is not fully 100% trained on Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That's what makes the last week so disastrous. Yeah, and especially you have Democrats who are, you know, wanting to go out and make this argument from him, who are saying that they haven't even heard from the president. I mean, you both worked on Capitol mm -hmm. Hill for a long time. Worked, you both worked for Harry Reid. Christian, I'm curious, you know, we heard today from Lloyd Doggett, a uh, uh, congressman from Texas, um, being the first out there to say Biden shouldn't run for your election. Is that is he going to be an anomaly, do you think? Or do you think that's going to allow more Democrats to follow suit and be public about this? Well, I think here's here's where the rubber meets the road. At the end of the day, there is no leverage to remove Joe Biden from the top of the ticket. That is a decision that he has to make in consultation with his family, looking at the poll and hearing what, what different members of the party are saying. Mm -hmm. And People need to understand right now, the enemy here is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the guy that we're running against. That's the issue at hand. Those conversations, they're happening absolutely on Capitol Hill. Everybody's mm -hmm. having these conversations. I'm a little astonished at how much these conversations are popping up in the media. That, again, is Joe Biden's decision at the end of the day. Yeah, can I, yeah. Caitlin, can I pick yeah. up on that, too? I, I think also the House is a really... Um, it is an interesting body to look at kind of this moment mm -hmm. that we're in through. It's mm -hmm. because the House is the firewall. You have a moment where the Senate does not look good for Democrats. And a lot mm -hmm. of Democrats, I think, view the House as kind of like the firewall, the last stand. Mm -hmm. If Donald Trump were to win, that's the only place that you could blunt a Trump MAGA mm -hmm. agenda. So hearing from people like former Speaker Pelosi, hearing from mm -hmm. close associates of President Biden like Jim mm -hmm. Clyburn, um, hearing from Democrats who are on the front lines in these tough mm -hmm. seats like Jarrett Golden and folks mm -hmm. like that. I think that's where a lot of the action is going to be. And mm -hmm. for folks who are trying to see over the mountains where, where this is going next, I think the mm -hmm. House is a really interesting place to get information. Yeah, and we'll see kind of whether the money starts flowing to those down ballot races instead. Uh, you know, I was talking to some Democratic donors today who were supportive of the president, but were saying, look, we don't really have any other options at this point. I mean, the idea of him stepping aside and then having kind of a free-for-all on the Democratic side for a nominee would introduce perhaps more chaos. I'm curious what you think about that so no, no, This is a really important point you're making. There is an anti-MAGA majority out there, right? Since 2016, 2018, 2020, 2022, the special elections, they always come out and vote against MAGA. They always come out and vote against Donald Trump. He is mm -hmm historically unpopular and a threat to our democracy in our country. We need to give those voters the clarity to come back to the Democrats and to vote in mass against Donald Trump. Joe Biden could be that candidate. He is that candidate currently. 
But mm -hmm. again, he has to make that decision in consultation with his family, his friends, uh, polls. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also thinking about, you know, at a time where the campaign should be trying to reach out to independent voters, those who, to your point, don't want to vote for Trump, want to vote against him, but are looking at Biden and thinking, is this really, you know, this Democrats are now focused on shoring up their base of support, which is fragile. That's exactly right. I mean, that's the thing that's so devastating also about what happened last week is not only obviously the fallout from Joe Biden as by his own acknowledgement, like not performing well, that moment, which was designed by the campaign to kind of clarify the race and to get your base rallied around President Biden, there was a missed opportunity there because what you needed to do was get base Democrats who have kind of been slow to come home, yeah. you needed them to come home faster. And mm -hmm. so I think right now the president has to stabilize support and then he can get mm -hmm. back, um, you know, assuming he is going forward as the nominee, he can get back to mm -hmm. bringing those Democrats home because the fall off in public opinion polling, like CBS polling, mm -hmm. has been with traditional Democratic constituencies. Right. I mean, I'm thinking of Nikki Haley supporters who the president has said, look, you can come to my side. Looking at that performance, it's, it, you know, what do you, are you concerned that it you know, may have reinforced doubts that people already had about the president? Well, what that debate did was reinforce everyone's opinion of Donald Trump. Donald Trump lied repeatedly. His January 6th... Yeah, but nobody is talking about that I today. know. Well, that's, that's the problem. That's why I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to re-inject it into this conversation. But no, to your, to your point, look, again, the, the president mm -hmm. has to make this decision in mm -hmm. council with his, his family, his friends, and, and his political advisors, and, and we have to go from there. And, and we are also curious about, you know, potentially Tim Ryan, who we just talked to, mentioned that he wants Kamala Harris to be at the top of the ticket. We actually have our own Nydia Cavazos, who is interviewing Kamala Harris right now. Whoa. Let's see if we can take that live here and get our first you reactions get from the your vice president. Take on yesterday's Supreme Court ruling on presidential immunity. We know that Chief Justice Roberts said that the president is not above the law. What's your take on this? Well, let's just be clear. It's one of the foundational principles in our system of justice that no one is above the law. And when we have a candidate in Donald Trump who's openly said he'll be a dictator on day one, that he will weaponize the Department of Justice against his political enemies, it is very likely that he could be immune from those kinds of acts. And we have to take seriously the stakes of this election in terms of the thought that we could have a president in the White House who thinks he's immune um, and able then to make decisions with that office that include weaponizing the Department of Justice against his political enemies or being a dictator on day one. And speaking about stakes, you just came out of a fundraiser. We know that many in your party have expressed concerns about President Biden's health. Just this morning, Congressman Doggett said that he's calling on President Biden to withdraw from the race, given that there's too, there's too much at stake to risk a Trump victory. What's your response to this? Look, Joe Biden is our nominee. We beat Trump once, and we're going to beat him again, period. Are you ready to lead the country if necessary? I am proud to be Joe Biden's running mate. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So you can see there, obviously, the the, the biggest topic of uh, of the day at the end there. Um, you know, she has been mentioned by some, as I mentioned, you know, Tim Ryan has been advocating for at the top of the ticket. What are you all hearing about that possibility? Oh, look, I hear Democrats just as much as they feel good about um, you know, Joe Biden or have felt good about Joe Biden, they feel just as good about Kamala Harris. And I think it's no small consequence that Kamala Harris has really spent a lot of time building up her public profile, really sharpening her public appeal. Um, I think she was strong there. I think she was strong the night of the debate, defending President Biden. And um, I'd imagine in any scenario, you're going to see a lot more Kamala Harris. I mean, it's notable that she just did that poll side right there with our own Nydia Cavazos. I mean, that signals that she wants to be out there, right? Kamala Harris has been on fire. She's out there. She is incredible at prosecuting the case on reproductive rights against Donald Trump. I, I hear a lot of good things about her right now from the mm -hmm. operatives chattering class out in here in, in, in D.C. And notably in the debate, the president really struggled to articulate the party's position on reproductive rights. Um, good gift for Nydia. Uh, great get for our Nidia Cavazos. Let's give her a big shout out right there, our star campaign reporter, uh, Christian Angel. Thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it.
New bombshell report on independent presidential candidate RFK Jr. The Vanity Fair journalist behind the piece joins us next. You're streaming America Decides. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has been denied a debate appearance and is struggling to get supporters to dig in deep for donations. Despite recent pitfalls, though, he's still battling to get his name on ballots across the country. CBS News has confirmed so far he's only done so in six states. And now a new report from Vanity Fair is leveling a range of new allegations about his conduct. The author of that article, Joe Hagan, joins us now. He's a special correspondent for Vanity Fair. Joe, good to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Um, really stunning reporting here. I want to talk about this sexual assault allegation against RFK Jr., which he did not deny when asked about it today. Tell us about how, you know, what you are learning about this, what you found. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I began this reporting about two months ago, and uh, I started to hear, you know, whispers of this kind of thing and uh, reached this woman who had been through a long process of trying to decide whether she wanted to come forward, as you can imagine, uh, requires a lot of um, guts to to come on the record and and uh, talk about things like this in public against a figure like uh, Bobby Kennedy, who's a powerful man from a powerful family. Um, and today, as you as you just pointed out, uh, those allegations came out. She was a babysitter for him in, in 1999, 1998. Um, and he uh, made some advances on her, unwanted advances on her, groped her, she says. She recorded some of this in her, a diary that was concurrent with the Times. Now, he was asked about it point blank today, and he said he had no comment on it, and also made some other comments that, uh, you know, uh, he's no church boy, and what he did in his youth, uh, you know, was he's got skeletons in his closet, he said. Uh, well, he was 45 at the time of these allegations, which sort of post post youth as far as I can tell. But uh, so he's not said anything about him. Uh, he hasn't expanded on it. He hasn't rebutted it. Yeah, uh, not a denial there in the least. Um, I'm curious, too, in your reporting, I mean, how much does the, can uh, the Kennedy family know about this candidate's conduct? I mean, it was striking, obviously, earlier this year. Lots of members mm -hmm. of the Kennedy family made a point to endorse Joe Biden. Um, but what yeah. have you found? Well, the family is well aware of uh, a history that has also been reported elsewhere, and which I record in my piece, uh, that he, you know, had various affairs over the years. That uh, during the time he was married to his second wife, and um, you know, some of his purported diaries leaked out into the press a few years ago, and uh, you know, they're aware of it. They're aware of a lot of his um, behaviors um, and pathologies, in which some of them were described to me by family members. Um, but there's a, a really interesting quote in my piece where I asked somebody very close to the family, I say, why won't the family be more public about what they know about him? And, uh, the answer was that, you know, if you start to unravel the problems with, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr., you may unravel the whole family tapestry. And so, you know, the mythology of the Kennedys is still a thing that they protect, uh, you know, very strongly. And, uh, that's why it's so painful for them to have to, uh, criticize him publicly in, in the ways they do. Um, yeah, that, that, that's fascinating, Joe. I mean, I, th I think a lot of people also obviously knew him for his name and also have known him for a while for promoting these, you know, anti-vaccine claims. I'm curious what you found the impact of that has been. Well, that was, um, you know, concurrently with a lot of the things I'm writing about, including the assault allegation, um, he went through a period of um, slowly breaking away from the environmental movement that he had made his name mm. uh, on. It's the face of some very, very, you know, progressive climate uh, focused uh, groups like River Keepers and uh, NRDC, the National Resource Defense Council. And as he began to make these claims, they began to step away from him because these were, you know, uh, not science based claims and they were a science based organizations. And by 2014, mm -hmm. he'd, he'd broken with uh, a couple of these groups. And after he met with Trump in 2006, 17, uh, Riverkeeper stepped away from his as well. And that sort of mm. is a breaking point. And uh, ever since then, he's embraced the anti-vax movement as his primary uh, sort of crusade.
Right. Well, Joe Hagan, thank you so much for your time and reporting. We encourage everybody to read your piece out in Vanity Fair. We appreciate your time. Thank you. And Jill Biden comes out swinging the first lady's efforts on the campaign trail as the president continues to be dogged with questions over his age. You're streaming America Decides. The First Lady traveled to the battleground state of Pennsylvania today to meet with local Latino residents. Jill Biden appeared in Allentown at an event hosted by the Congressional Hispanic Caucus this afternoon. Today we're here to talk about education and the pathways to good paying jobs, because that's how we grow the middle class. And just as Congresswoman Velasquez just said, it's how we grow Latino economic power, too, so that everyone has a place at the table. All right, so that was in Pennsylvania, and our Shauna Mizell is now in Middleville, Michigan, and she's there because the First Lady is expected to be there tomorrow for another campaign stop. Uh, Shauna, good to see you. So tell us, what will the First Lady be doing in Michigan? Caitlin, good afternoon. Great to be with you. That's exactly right. First Lady Jill Biden expected to hit Middleville, Michigan tomorrow on the heels of her Pennsylvania visit. But this will not be a campaign event. This is actually going to be Jill Biden in her official capacity as the First Lady. And she is expected to do a couple of events. One is going to be to highlight a summer nutrition program for children. And the other is going to be to highlight a program for children of wounded veterans. Now, she's making these stops either for the campaign or official, as you note. But, uh, of course, there is this huge elephant in the room uh, regarding the president, her husband. I'm curious how, whether you're hearing from voters about that when they are anticipating the, for the first lady's forthcoming visit and kind of the election as a whole. That's exactly right. I spoke to multiple voters here in Middletown, Michigan. A lot of them were not enthused with the prospect of the First Lady coming to visit tomorrow. But let's take a listen to what one voter, one voter told me who was not particularly keen on either Trump or Biden. For me, it's a no-win situation because the fact is, either one of them, we already know what's, what's going to happen with both of them. We've already had an example of both of them. I don't think we're going to win Michigan with a Democratic president. I think we'll win it with a Republican. So you think Trump's going to win here? I think of, out of the two evils, I, I think you're leaning that way. And that man that we just heard from also said that Jill Biden shouldn't be spending her time in a rural town like Middleville. He suggested she be in bigger cities like Lansing or Grand Rapids. And, Shauna, the reason that she's there, of course, is because Michigan is a big battleground state. This is a state that could determine the uh, presidency here. Um, give us a sense of, you know, kind of the stakes in Michigan. Just how critical is this state to the election? Michigan is going to be extremely critical, but particularly for Democrats. The state has 15 electoral votes that will be up for grabs this November. And this is a state that Trump won in 2016 and Biden won in 2020. We also saw some Democratic wins during the midterm elections. But this is going to be a crucial battleground state this November. All right, Shauna Mizell on the ground for us. As always, thank you so much for your time and reporting. My fellow citizens, we have come now to a time of testing. We must not fail. Let us close the springs of racial poison. Let us pray for wise and understanding hearts. And that, of course, was President Lyndon B. Johnson 60 years ago today, moments before signing the Civil Rights Act into law. The legislation banned discrimination based on race, gender, national origin, and religion. It also barred segregation in employment, education, and at the ballot box. President Biden today called the law, quote, one of the most significant pieces of civil rights legislation in history. And that does it for us today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. The Daily Report with John Dickerson starts right now.